All right. Good morning. We're uh, we're starting a couple minutes early here just to make sure we're uh, we're hooked up and and have a good connection. Things look so far so good. We're back at our uh, our, our Yetter Studios here in Macomb uh, today. So thanks to the Yetter Group for uh, allowing us to use their facility. I had some stuff I wanted to do on the whiteboard here, so I've uh, I've already started working ahead, mapping out some of the things I want to talk about on the whiteboard. So I've uh, got a pretty jam-packed agenda here for this morning, and and as always, we will we will interrupt our agenda for your questions, and uh, please ask them. I did a I did a live Ask the Agronomist yesterday, which was really cool. <clears throat> we don't get to do many live meetings with actual real human beings in in the room with us, and it was uh, it was great. So uh, shout out to the uh, to the Zimmer crowd for uh, for having a good dealer meeting, grower meeting yesterday. Um, had a great time. We we spent about two hours with a group of uh, of really good inquisitive growers, uh, asking a lot of questions, and uh, and and had a blast. I one one of the participants that that knows me well and knows how well I, how much I like to talk. He uh, he gave me some advice. He says, you know, uh, a preacher told me one time that. Uh, your 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 mind can only absorb what your rear end can endure, and uh, I told him to find a comfortable chair. Was the coaching that um, that I gave that gentleman? <laughs> so we all we all had a good time, or at least I did. So thanks uh, thanks to Zimmer Seeds for uh, for hosting that meeting, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us here on Ask the Agronomist this morning. And we're gonna we're gonna start off by you know addressing what what uh, what could be termed the. Uh, the elephant in the room. I've I've had we've had lots of questions. The wait a minute, Lance. Yeah. Is that is that how old you are today? Yeah. This oh, is the, it, this it, is the birthday. Yeah. So, ask the so 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 yes, it is my birthday, and and I'm not sure if Adam's calling me old or fat, but I am an elephant, and I am in the room here. So, uh, thanks. Again. No, that's not what I'll get that at all. <laughs> So, so uh, anyway, Adam and I will continue to poke fun at each other. So Dirt Dog uh, says happy birthday, man. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm uh, I'm 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 a 1970 model, so 50 <laughs> fi 52 today, and uh, happy to be here with you. So so anyway, I've, I've had several people uh, tease me the last couple of days if if we were going to talk about our recent announcement, and, and we've had some big announcements the last couple of weeks, and. You know, two two weeks ago, I, I thought the the force majeure on glyphosate was was going to be the big news, and uh, little did I know that might not be the biggest news that uh, that that we're having within the Bayer organization. So we announced a couple of days ago that we have entered into a uh, an agreement to a distribution agreement, and I'll define you know what distribution means versus licensing here in a minute uh, to offer um, the the Enlist E three uh, platform through a distribution distribution agreement with MS Technologies. And, and they're the developer of that. And, and I think there'll be some people that, you know, accuse us of being hypocrites for, for uh, offering a system that we've been competing against very aggressively in the marketplace for the last couple of years. And I can assure you that everybody who works for Bear uh, has a friend or former colleague that works for a competitive company that's been offering that system. And the teasing from those people has been merciless the last couple of days, uh, giving us a, a hard time about coming over to the other side, as, as they would put it. Um, you know, the reality of the situation is there, there, all, there are alternative systems in the marketplace and, and we have customers that are interested in those alternative systems. And also our seed dealers, especially those that, that Asgro or DeKalb is their only brand that they offer, uh, they, need to be, they need to have alternatives to offer to customers that, that are looking for those other options. Uh, the Round of Pretty Extend platform continues to be the number one um, soybean system based on acres and volume and sales in the, in the industry, and, and we hope that continues, and, and we're going to work aggressively to, to uh, hopefully keep that, uh, that number one position. And our defense and support um, of that system is, is absolutely unwavering. Um, we will continue to demonstrate that the Extend Flex system offers, we feel, the best germplasm highest yield potential and the best weed control of any system in the marketplace today. Um, you know, at the same time, starting in 2023, so I also want to clarify that we, we are not offering any E3 products for sale in 2022. Uh, but starting in 2023, uh, we will be able to offer the Enlist system to our customers who would prefer it through this distribution agreement. Now, I, I want to also clarify that you know, Asgro is not breeding E3s. Um, Asgro is not going to offer E3s. 
uh, we will be able to offer um, E3 germplasm, the E3 trait system, uh, through another brand that we will be distributing. So it, it won't be under the Asgrow brand. Um, you know, Asgrow is not breeding with the trait. Uh, Asgrow is still focused on, you know, what we feel will be the future of, of soybean wheat control with HT4, HT5, and other new chemistries that, uh, that Bayer is going to develop and, and bring to the marketplace. So uh, <clears throat> just wanted to, to clarify that and, um, and get, get that out there. Uh, if you've got questions, if they're real specific, I probably won't have the answers to them. But if you do have questions, feel free to chat them in. Um, you know, talk to your, you know, there's going to be lots of information and misinformation out there about what this means and, and what it means and what it doesn't mean. Um, I, I think much like the force majeure on Roundup, which you'll know, touch on that real quickly as well. Um, you know, we, we all learned a new word uh, a couple weeks ago. Most people did not know what force majeure was or what force majeure meant. But uh, basically, that's a, that's a legal term that legally gives a manufacturer the ability to, you know, essentially break a contract or, or not commit, uh, fulfill a commitment on a contract if uh, a supplier that's required in the manufacturing process of a product cannot deliver, you know, product that uh, they had agreed to deliver to enable the manufacturer to make their product. Um, so it's, you know, if, if you're in the manufacturing industry, um, it might not be a strange term to you, but for us, it was it was a strange term. And if you looked at Twitter and Facebook and 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 any farmer chat room on on the internet, uh, you'd think there wasn't any Roundup, and nobody was going to have any Roundup, and and the sky was falling. And and as it turns out, it it's not as big a deal as it as it sounded like it was when people first got the announcement. And I kind of think our announcement that we're going to, you know, have a distribution agreement on Enlist Soybeans is, is probably not also as big a deal as, as some people are making it out to be. But uh, we will be able to offer that option to our dealers to sell to their customers who, who are looking for that. So wanted to get that out of the way. If there's uh, more questions around either of those topics, we'll, we'll certainly take them, do our best. Uh, don't, don't have all the answers or all the details. But um, I, I really felt you would think we were being disingenuous if we didn't uh, if we didn't tackle the the subject here at the start so with that i will uh, i will jump into agronomy and and you can see on the board here behind me and i'm probably going to move the board around so you can so you can see things on it and apologize that uh i, I may have adam help me with uh, uh til tilting the camera lens here and and at times i want the board to be more in focus than me so if you end up looking at you know my arm or my belly or uh, my belt loops. I apologize, but uh, <clears throat> basically, we've 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 kind of mapped out a field here, and, and I want to talk about. Um, I wanted to spend some time talking about hybrid positioning, hybrid placement, and and as part of that, scripting. And and I think scripting is a is an area where a, a lot of us are using planters that are capable of executing a script. Uh, most of us that are using a planter that is capable of executing a script have not created a script for that planter to execute. And we're, and we're probably leaving some bushels on the table. And in some cases might be wasting a little bit of money on seed by not taking advantage of that technology. And, and it is very readily available. Uh, advanced scripting through, through climate field view is, I think, a, is it a dollar an acre, Adam, for, for scripts, I believe. They're very easy to generate. You can create them yourself. Uh, you can create multiple scripts per field. Um, and, and you're going to pay that $1 per acre for that scripting service and, and with, with the science behind it, but there's yeah. even some manual scripting capabilities yes. you can do yourself. Yes. Or, so, so yeah, if you're willing, if you want to do it manually, which I, which I don't recommend the manual process to save the dollar, but if no. you want to save the dollar, uh, there is a free scripting service. That's a, that's a manual service. I, I wouldn't recommend it. We're not trying to get your dollar, but the, the advanced scripting would, would be easier, better. Um, probably than, than one you're going to create yourself. Uh, also, don't recommend scripting by soil type, which is which is the easiest way to do it. Uh, and, and that technology has been around for years. Um, and, and you might look at this and go, well, isn't that a soil type map that you drew on, on the board here? And actually, no, this is a, these are yield regions or yield zones that I've identified in, in this theoretical field. We've got region A with an average yield of, of 170. Region B with an average yield of 200, Region C with an average yield of 260, and Region D with an average yield of 230. So if you if you theoretically assumed, I don't have it quite drawn this way, but it's close. 
if you assume 25% of the field was in each of those regions, your field average yield would be 215. But your field, your your yield is ranging from 170 to 260 based on these regions. And the, and the true, you know, and, and I'm simplifying this because within region A, not every acre within region A is, is yielding 170. You know, there's a range of yields even within each region. And the nice thing about scripting is it enables you to plant the appropriate population based on your yield goal, essentially for every square foot within the field. And, and some of these planters these days, the technology that's on them, they can change population, you know, instantly on the go, even at 10 mile an hour. And it's pretty impressive how quickly they can change from 27,000 to 32,000 to 40,000. Um, I also want to spend some time talking about, you know, our, our population work that we do with hybrids. And I've got some data here that I'm going to show. And this is actual population data for multiple years, multiple, you know, about 70 some locations, replicated studies each year that we do these population trials at. And these are 10 different hybrids. And, and these 10 hybrids range in maturity from, uh, I think, 102 up to 116 RM hybrids. There's some very diverse genetics in, in the hybrids that I picked. And basically what you're looking at here is the range and recommended population based on economics. So we base our population recommendations on the price of the grain and the price of the seed. And we're looking at where, you know, at the point where more seed no longer makes you more money, you know, that's where we'll cut it off. And so we've got what we call yield optimum population. So if you're just trying to win a yield contest, what's the right population? These are what we call economic optimum populations. Again, for the yield, for the yield goal range of 170 to 260 for this particular and if you look at the populations on the left-hand side, these would be the low-end populations for each of these different hybrids. On the right-hand side, you'll see the high-end populations for each of these different hybrids. And some of them get scary high. Uh, so keep in mind that these populations on the right side would be a recommendation if you're doing variable rate scripting for those high-yield region parts of your field. I would never recommend with standard traditional corn, when we get to short corn, this may change, but with today's hybrids, I would ne never recommend you planting an entire field at 44,000 seeds per acre. However, with some hybrids, the sweet spot of your field, I'd be very comfortable with 44,000 seeds per acre as, as your planting rate. The thing I'd like to point out is notice the range in population is a lot greater based on yield level than it is based on hybrid. So if you look down that hybrid list, you'll see here's a block of hybrids, six of them right in the middle, that essentially their population response curve is identical. And, and I'll show you some response curves here in a minute and what I mean by that. But, but we see less variance in optimal population based on genetics than we do based on yield level. So if you look at all these hybrids, they're ranging six to, you know, in some cases over 10,000 seeds per acre difference in optimal seeding rate based on are you in a 170 bushel yield environment or are you in a 260 bushel yield environment? And I picked a, kind of one of the hybrids in the middle and I thought this was interesting as well. So here in this field with our average yield of, of 215, theoretically, based on a 215 yield goal with this particular the hybrid, seats per acre. And that's probably not too far off of where a lot of you are at. If you break it down by yield level, you know, what that script is going to do is everywhere in the field where we expect it to make 170, you'll be dropping 34. Everywhere in the field, we expect the yield to be 200, you'll be dropping 36. 230 would be 38. 260 would be 40 with this particular hybrid that I chose for this illustration. And, and really what, <clears throat> what we do planting the entire field at one static population, whether it's 34, you know, 36, 37, wherever you're at today, if you planted this whole field at 37,000, you'd be overplanting in region A, you'd be slightly overplanting in region B. Push, push it back just a little bit. Like you, you'd be slightly underplanting in region D, 
and you'd be significantly underplanting in in region C. And so what what that effectively is going to do to your ROI is you're probably not losing much yield by overplanting in A, but you're wasting dollars on seed. B, you're wasting a few dollars on seed. In D, you're probably giving up a, a, a few bushels, so you're giving up yield. And, and you have no idea, even though C is the highest yielding region of this field, I would argue you have no idea how good C actually could be because C is always getting significantly under planted. I would argue C is probably also under fertilized in many cases because we're probably not putting on enough fertilizer to keep up with the yield removal in zone C. So even though zone C is always the best part of this field, and you're always proud of how well it does, I would argue you don't know how good it could be if, if you had the right fertility level to support the yield potential of that zone and the right population to support the yield potential of that zone. So <clears throat> Adam, I'll, I'll pause there while I'm doing some erasing. Uh, any, any thoughts or questions or, or comments? Um, no questions coming in right now, Lance, okay. no. I do think it's something that, uh, you know, a lot of people, there, there's maybe something you can address out there in the countryside that's really related to this, not so much the variability part of it, but just populations in general, um, you know, where we're going with populations in general and breeding. Uh, there, there's some people in the countryside that uh, think that we need to start bringing populations back down for different reasons. And maybe you could try to address yeah. that throughout this conversation. Okay. Well, we'll, um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll touch on that briefly. So, so I would, I would argue that, and I'm going to, I'm going to reposition the camera here just to uh, come back with you for a minute. So <clears throat> I, I would say that r really in the history of corn breeding, the primary way we have increased the yield potential of corn is by making it more stress tolerant and by making corn more stress tolerant, we've enabled it to withstand higher populations. And enabling it to withstand higher populations, we can increase our seeding rates. And, and that's how we've driven yield gains in corn. If you took uh, a single seed of Reed's Yellow Dent, which would have been in a popular open pollinated hybrid or not hybrid variety uh, back in the day. If you planted a single plant of, ye of Reed's Yellow Dent and took good care of it, and right next to it, you planted a single seed of pick your DKC hybrid, 6595, let's say, our, our top selling hybrid today in, in West Central Illinois, and you grew those two plants out and you harvested the yield from those two individual plants, there's a very good chance that Reed's Yellow Dent, one plant, would produce more pounds of grain than one plant of DKC 6595. The difference is Reed's Yellow Dent would have been planted at about I don't know, 15, 16, 18,000 plants per acre. And if you planted it any thicker than that, it, it could have been a disaster. Whereas 6595, if you look at our population data in a high yield environment, needs to be over 40,000 uh, plants per acre to maximize the yield of that particular hybrid. So we have been driving yield in corn by enabling it to withstand higher populations. If you like to follow the NCGA yield contest, when the NCGA yield contest results come out, they always share the planting populations of the, of the winners. And if you want to look at, you know, if you want to scare yourself, look at where those guys are planting. There's very few NCGA contest winners with a seeding rate below 40, and there are several with seeding rates above 50. So, so the, the key to unlocking super high yields of corn is figuring out a way to achieve high populations without achieving disasters you know so disasters do occur you can have more root lodging you can have more stock lodging you can have you know harvestability issues uh, so if you're going to push for high populations you have to understand that there's there's management to come along with that that management might be better fertility that management might be more aggressive use of fungicide that manage, management might be more timely harvest um, if if you farm like like my dad uh, did 15 years ago and, and you don't want to pick anything till it's under 17% because you don't want to dry corn, well, 44,000 seeding rates, probably not for you. Um, you. You just can't necessarily uh, leave that out there, you know, as late into the season. 
But if your objective is to, you know, get all you can out of that acre and you like to start harvest at 25 or 26 percent, you know, then you can get more aggressive with your yield goals. You can get more aggressive with your seeding rates and, and you can push that corn uh, for more. So you know, I think with the with short corn coming out in, in a couple of years, I think that's going to enable us. The, the short corn germplasm, our goal is to have yield parity. Uh, so I don't think the germplasm itself is necessarily going to be head and shoulders better from a yield yield potential than what we're selling today, but it will give you the peace of mind and the confidence and the security if you want to, to start to push your seeding rates higher. Short corn has uh, obviously, you know, the, the physics of short corn are more in its favor at, at, uh, at higher seeding rates. The stalk girth and diameter is larger. The, the root mass is larger. We see dramatically reduced stock lodging, dramatically reduced uh, wind damage and green snap with short corn compared to traditional corn. Uh, and that's going to enable you, if you're, if you're ready to, to start to push your populations higher. We don't plan on requiring higher seeding rates with short corn. So I, I think a few years ago, people thought that if we went to short corn, that'd mean narrow rows and, and, and crazy high seeding rates. That's not our objective with short corn, but if you want to go there as a way of chasing higher yields, that system will allow you to do that with, I think, more peace of mind than you could do today with, with current hybrids. So, so, question Adam. Yeah, we had a question come in and I just I just uh also when it comes to short corn, I think we're gonna start referring to it as smart corn nowadays. Yeah. And I think the angle on the smart corn terminology is probably just some of the management practices that it opens up with that shorter statured corn right. that we might be able to do. We might be able to be a little smarter about some of our applications, some of our inputs, some of our management of that product. And to that end, Dirt Doctor Pool has a question. He says, uh, if we plant corn at higher populations, do we create an environment that favors tar spot, mm -hmm. uh, similar to white mold and soybeans with that yep. thicker, greater canopy? Yep. Yep. No, we, that's a great question. And, and honestly, you know, we're, we're being honest on Ask the Agronomist. Uh, I would say, yes, we do. Uh, we don't have a ton of data uh, looking at that yet. I think over time, we'll have the ability to make those observations. But if you've got a lusher, denser you know the, the frustrating thing about tar spot is and there's other diseases that are this way too uh sudden death syndrome and soybeans is a, is a little bit this way um crown rotten corn is a little bit this way there are certain diseases that that the very things you do to push yield um make the potential to have that disease greater and make the yield loss that can come from that disease greater so so there's trade-offs and everything and, and as we push populations, as we narrow row spacings, as we make that canopy denser, as we make that canopy lusher and fu fuller earlier in the season, um, we, we are in fact creating a better environment for tar spot. So, so it is, is there a point where you're better off giving up some yield potential to reduce the potential for a disease or are there better ways to address the disease and, and we're working on those better ways to address the disease. So I don't really want to manage diseases by reducing my yield potential. But the reality is there are diseases that are absolutely made worse by trying to increase your yield. And, and again, I, I think crown rot is, is probably one of the better examples of this. That is a disease of good soil, high fertility, high populations, early planting. So everything you're doing to make better corn is making crown rot more likely to impact your field. Okay, so uh, we'll get into, uh, and I'll show some, I'll try to show some pictures here so you can see what, what I mean. Um, we, we generate these population curves for every decalb hybrid that, that we sell. And there's multiple years of research behind these. I'm gonna pick out, um, uh, let's see, I'll pick out uh, here, 5982. So, so 5982 would actually be the, the number one volume hybrid in the DeKalb brand. Um, not the number one volume hybrid in, in our part of the world, but, but certainly a large part of our sales as well. So what you can see is this is, this is what we call the, the population response curve for DeKalb 5982. And the four yield environments on here are the same four yield environments we use in our example. So 170, 200, 230, and 260. 
And what you can see plotted across the bottom of the chart is population. What you can see plotted on the vertical axis on the chart is yield level. And then the curve is the yield response of the hybrid in those different yield environments. So in this low yield environment, this 170 yield environment, we're saying the optimal population for 5982 is 34, actually 34,640 seeds per acre. So if you can get it dialed in that precisely, um, my, more, more power to you. And as you can see, the data does suggest that if you plant too thick with this hybrid in a low yield environment, your yield does actually start to decline up here on the, on the high end. So if you really get carried away in that low yield environment, out here on the tail, you're losing money two ways. You're losing yield and you're wasting a lot of money on seed. As the yield environment climbs, it gets harder and harder and harder to lose yield by overseeding. Now you do still lose money by overseeding because you're, you're spending money on seed that's not giving you a return. Um, but, but that's a fairly typical yield response curve not just for a DeKalb hybrid, but I would argue for, for any modern hybrid on the market today would not vary significantly from that. And as you can see here, looking at this hybrid, you know, <clears throat> if you're in a 260 bushel yield environment, you know, a little over 40,000 is, is what we're recommending your seed drop would be. And just to let you know, this, these curves were generated based on a $5 corn price. So that was uh, pre-Russian pre invasion corn price when I developed this and, uh, and, and a $300 bag of corn. And, and some of you guys are going to sell corn for $6 and some of you are buying seed for less than $300. And, and if you plug in $6 and 280 instead of 300, all these populations are going up. And I understand they're already high enough to make you pucker. Uh, but there's a lot of data behind this. And, and if you've been uncomfortable uh, testing or, or trying some higher seeding rates, I'll take that over, Adam, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, a, a script is a good way to do it. So what you can do with your script, uh, if you want to play around a little bit, I'm going I'm to kind of redraw my field just quickly. So, <clears throat> so we've got our zones throughout the field. And if you're running a script through the field, that script's going to change population going through the field. If you want to, you can drop anywhere you want. You can drop what we call a static population block into these fields. So you can script the whole field and plant this block right here, static at 34,000 if you want. And then on each pass, you can compare the yield of the pass very easily uh, and compare those populations. If you want to do your own script and compare it to our script, you, you can do that. You could run an advanced script on half the field and compare that to you know, your own personal ideas of how to create a, a planting script and, and do that very easily with, within climate. So there's a lot of ways you can uh, evaluate these different things. Um, you know, we get lots of questions about, well, if I'm going to plant really, really high populations, do I need more nitrogen? Do I need to change my fertility program? I think if you're matching your seeding rate to the yield potential of your field. So, <clears throat> so this zone right here has always yielded more. Now, are there years where it doesn't yield more? Yes. Can you get wackiness that, so let's say this area is the heaviest ground in the field, the best ground in the field. And in a super wet year, you know, if it's not really well tiled, that area might suffer more from excess moisture. So if you have a really wet year, the highest yielding part of your field, could become the lowest yielding part of your field. And we saw some of that last year. And, and that keeps some people from stepping into this arena because they're like, well, if, if, it's, if it's not consistent, am I doing myself more harm than good? And if you've got a field that is really inconsistent where year after year after year, the, the best part of the field moves to someplace else, then that's probably not the best field for scripting. But if you've got fields that this part of the field's always the best and this part of the field's always the worst, that's an ideal field to, to try scripting in. But <clears throat> what I would argue is this area of the field without extra fertility has always been producing the best crop. And I would say that without extra fertility, if you increase the population in this part of the field, it's going to do even better. However, I will acknowledge that if this area has been being under fertilized historically, 
if you're going to push populations, I think it would be wise to also continue to, you know, feed that crop sufficiently to support what you're trying to achieve there. And, and if this area has been being under fertilized, uh, it's been yielding great, not because of the fertility program. It's been yielding great because that region of the field is just, it's got the best soil. It's got the best drainage. It's maybe just the right slope. So it's always got good drainage. Um, you know, maybe you got better tile system in this part of the field than you do other parts of the field. The, the, the reason this area of the field is, is good is not because it has low fertility. It has low fertility in some cases because it's been so good every year that we've been mining that part of the field year after year after year slowly. And we just never put enough fertility on that part of the field to support the yield that's coming off of it. And, and I think we're probably holding that area of the field back, uh, not just by underplanting it, but maybe also by under fertilizing it. So I'm going to draw a few, you know, <clears throat> draw an example yield response curve up here on the board where it's maybe a little bit easier to see than the piece of paper that I had. And like I, like I said, they do not change near as much as you might think across hybrids. So, so the, the, the response curves kind of always have this sort of shape to them. You know, some of them tail off a little bit more if you get too high than others. Some of them never tail off at all. So, so 6595 looks a lot like this. Uh, our population, you know, 6595 is our number one volume selling hybrid. Um, we're sold out of it. And we'd be even more sold out of it if you were planting the seeding rate that our data says you, you ought to be planting. So Adam about spit coffee there when I said that. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, just to... Just a, just a little agronomy humor for our tight supply seed situation. Apologize for that. So, <clears throat> so anyway, some hybrids are very, very responsive to, to population. Um, and, and then as you go, as the yield level changes, so, so remember we had yield on the, on the X axis. So at the, at the really low end side of this yield scale, we're over planting almost all the time. We, we've done a good job convincing growers that you need to increase population. Well, we've increased population on average. And so we are over planting a lot of acres. We are under planting probably more acres than we're over planting. But if you switch to a scripting approach, I would say your average seeding rate, if you're planting somewhere between 35 and 37,000 today, your average seeding rate will change minimally. But your range will get much, much wider than you are today. And, and I talk to growers about scripting and they'll say, well, I want to do a script, but I don't want to plant anything less than 32 and I don't want to plant anything greater than 36. And I said, well, set it on 35.5 and forget the script then because it's not worth messing with. Get comfortable with a 10,000 seeds per acre planting range. If you've got a field that's, that's, that's ideal for scripting, if there's a lot of variability, if you've got regions of the field that are, that are never going to make 200, you don't need 34,000 seeds to yield 180 bushel. Uh, and if you've got areas of the field that you've got a legitimate 280 potential, you know, hold on to your hat for what the script is going to say your seeding rate ought to be. Now there are tools in, in the, we built this into the tool because we're, because we're nice and, and we understand that opinions vary on what seeding rate should be. So there's this slide feature built into the tool so, so you can, you can generate your script and it's going to tell you, you know, it's going to break the field up into these zones. And, and let's say the average seeding rate of that script is 37,000. And let's say it's ranging from 30 to 42. You can just dial that down, maybe 90% or 10%, 15%, 5%, whatever makes you comfortable. You can dial that down, but if you dial it down, do not dial the regions down differently. Keep it, keep it proportional. So, so like I say, the, the, the guy that didn't want to go above 32 or below 32 and a, uh, above 36, you know, if, if you dial this region down uh, 20% and you dial this region up 10%, then you've just defeated the whole purpose of doing the script. 
So, so even though the tool gives you the ability to do that, resist the temptation to monkey with it in, in ways that, that kind of make it not worth doing. I hope the, uh, I hope the visual stuff I'm trying to do today is not too distracting and too clunky. And, um, it's, we don't, we don't actually have a cameraman here. So like Adam's like tipping the tipping the laptop and stuff to, to try to zoom in and, and keep things in focus. So, and, and no matter what he does, I still look like crap. So you can't, uh, you can't, you can't fix that. But, um, so, so, and then on, on top of all this with, you know, we, we've got population, um, you know, when I talk to growers about, you know, seed selection, you know, I, I tend to start first with trait. Uh, I think trait decision is the first one you need to make, because if you if you've got rootworm and you need smart stacks, then you're working from this list of options. If you don't have rootworm, don't plant smart stacks. You know, I can't say that more bluntly. Uh, that's an argument that I continue to have with growers. If you're on rotated ground in West Central Illinois and we can't find rootworm pressure, you're not doing yourself any favors by by planting seed that, that costs more and and possibly giving up the yield potential of a, of a high yielding double pro or tricepta. So so the first decision you need to make is what trait do you need? And I would argue plant the trait that you need. And if you don't need it, don't plant it. Um, can't can't say it any more uh, bluntly than that. Um, second decision, I think, needs to be maturity. So, so when we, you know, we've created some script, some, some seed recommendation tools that <clears throat> weren't built smart enough to be as smart as you. So they weren't designed to take trait into uh, account. They weren't designed to take maturity into account. And if you ask us, what's the best hybrid to plant on your field in central Illinois, uh, it's never going to be 106 day corn. But if you need 106 day corn, it doesn't matter that that's not the best hybrid to put in the field. What you need our tool to do is recommend the best 106 day corn for that field. It doesn't matter if 114 day corn would yield 25 bushel more if you want 106 day corn. So as we're improving and enhancing these tools, they need to be designed so that you can put the parameters into the tool that you need to put into the tool. And then the tool will help you select the best hybrid that fits your parameters. So after trait, after maturity, you know, then obviously pr probably yields coming in next. You know, if, if you want 106 day smart stacks, you know, do you want a good one or do you want a bad one? Of course, you want a good one. So so then we're looking at yield. We're looking at agronomics. You start getting into things like, you know, plant health, uh, standability, stocks, roots, you know, test weight, grain quality, you know, all, all those other factors that, that go into hybrid selection. So. I think this is a good time of year to, to sit down with your dealer, you know, look at the hybrids that you've got on order. Uh, hopefully we don't need to change that order dramatically. That might be tricky. Um, but um, you know, Adam's nodding behind the, behind the camera there. So the acknowledgement from FSR that we, uh, we don't want to be making any radical changes, but um, you know, we can talk about, you know, what hybrid really ought to be in this field how that hybrid ought to be managed, how that hybrid should be planted. If you, if you want to try scripting, you know, we've got some time here, you know, look, looking at how wet it is right now, I uh, might have more time than we want to, uh, to get ready before spring planting, but things change in a hurry. And, uh, and if you've got a planter that is capable of, of executing a script and you've never tried one, I, I, I would, I would encourage you to, Pick a couple of your most variable fields. That's kind of the low hanging fruit. If, if you've got a, if you've got an 80 that varies 20 bushel from low to high across the 80, don't waste your time scripting that field. There's not enough yield variability out there. Now, if there's an 80 that's only varying 20 bushel from one part of the field to the next, I'm not sure I've ever seen that field. You know, typically, even in a relatively uniform field, you're going to have 60, 80 bushel variation in yield across that field. And, and oftentimes it'll be over a hundred. So if you've got fields that typically have, I'd say 60 bushel or more yield range across the field, th that's where I would start trying scripting first. And the more variable the field, the easier it will be to see a benefit from the script. And, and if there's a benefit from the script, that's gonna mean more money in your pocket. It's gonna mean you're saving money on seed in parts of the field and increasing yield. And so in, in theory, you can, you can gain two ways. Now you're going to reinvest the savings in this part of the field in seed. 
in making a bigger investment in your seeding rate in, in other parts of the field. So like I say, depending on where your seeding rate is today, you might see a slight increase in your average seeding rate. You might not, but you're going to see, you know, a pretty dramatic range in seeding rates across the field. Um, it used to be with some of the, you know, when we had, um, you know, like hydraulic drive was, was the only way that we were able to vary population. Sometimes those systems couldn't change fast enough. Sometimes they couldn't change enough uh, to really do a good job executing some of these um, scripts. But if, if well, with a lot of the electronic, uh, um, you know, electric driven meters that are on the market today, those things can change almost instantly and they can change almost infinitely uh, how high you can get, how low you can get, you know, just almost instantly. So I've got some farms at home that, that literally go from pretty good silt loam to sand in about 10 feet and, and the yield can change 150 bushel. And that sand knob probably ought to be planted at about 20,000 and the good stuff 50 feet away from the sand knob probably ought to be planted at 40. And, and finally, I've got a planter that is actually capable of doing that. For a lot of years, I've talked about this and not been able to do it at home because I didn't have the planter technology that I needed to. But, uh, but I do now, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, getting into the scripting uh, myself. So with that, I don't know if we've had any questions come in on the chat, Adam. Um, we've, we've probably spent enough time on populations and scripting and, and hybrid placement uh, going into spring here. That was kind of a, a topic that I wanted to cover. Um, you know, we can end early if we don't have questions. We don't, uh, we don't often end early here on Ask the Agronomist, but I, I, I did a two and a half hour live Ask the Agronomist yesterday. So I've kind of got my, you know, kind of a little bit satisfied with my Ask the Agronomist need. And so we can, uh, we can end early here if, uh, if we don't have any more questions coming in. We don't have any questions at the moment, but, you know, we've done a lot of, there's been a lot of conversation about corn variable rate population, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, we, we do got, raise we other crops. Other crop. Yeah, we got yeah. another major crop around here that maybe we should talk Alpha, about Alpha? a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. We, yeah. <laughs> so so let, let's talk about variable rate soybeans. So, so, so soybeans don't get as much attention as corn in, in many, many, many ways. And, and population response hasn't been as studied in soybeans as it has been in corn. And they respond very differently to population than corn. It's, it's almost the opposite. So let's, let's make, let's draw, redraw our field here. And let's say we've got uh, uh, 90 bushel bean yield potential up here, 75 here, 70 here, and lowly a little corner down here, 55 bushel yield potential. So, so if this was corn, here would be your highest seeding rate, right? With soybeans, down here is your highest seeding rate. So soybeans are just the inverse of corn. So, so they're, the, they're the inverse of corn in many, many ways. I, I said on average, we're under planting our corn. On average, we're over planting our soybeans. Most of us could reduce our soybean seeding rate and, and not see any negative, might see a positive impact in yield in some cases. So when you've got a very high yield environment and you've got good soil, you've got good fertility, you've got an environment where you're going to get a lot of vegetative growth in soybeans, you don't need as many plants. If this knob down here, light timber soil or clay, tight clay or whatever it is that's, that's lowering your yield potential is probably also stunting the vegetative growth of the, of the plant. So to get the same number of nodes per acre, which your nodes is where your yield is going to come from. You may need more plants to make more nodes because each plant is going to be shorter down here in this region of the field. <clears throat> so I would say that, you know, there's, there is promise for variable rate seeding in soybeans, just like there is in corn. Uh, if your soybean planter is capable of doing it, I wouldn't shy away from it. Uh, I would say just like I'm feeling comfortable with high seeding rates in corn, if you want to do this in soybeans, get comfortable with low seeding rates in soybeans. 100, 110, 120 at the absolute most. And, and down here in the rougher, lower yielding part of the field, maybe your seeding rate gets up to 160, 170, maybe at the, at the upper end. You know, we're not talking, you know, 200,000 seeding rates anywhere on soybeans unless we're planting, you know, in late June or something like that. Uh, but I would say the, the seeding rate range in soybeans probably needs to be <clears throat> somewhere between 100 and 140 
150 typically is, is the range that I would operate in. And um, you know, we, we tend to plant beans based on what you like to see when they come up rather than where they absolutely need to be planted at and, and give, them, give them credit for being able to compensate. There's a lot of fields of thin beans that get replanted every year that, that probably didn't need to be, um, assuming we can keep them clean. And, and obviously population at, at some point gets low enough that we start to sacrifice weed control. So you, you do need enough plants to keep the ground shaded, to keep the field clean. Uh, I would say based on my own experience on my own farm, that, that breaking point somewhere around 60,000, if you get under 60,000, even if they're uniformly spaced, it's hard to get a dense enough canopy to, to give you season long weed control. Above 60,000, you know, I haven't really seen that many breaks in weed control, um, but obviously the, the thicker, the denser that canopy, the more help you're getting from the crop canopy competition uh, to help keep the field clean. Uh, back in the olden days when seed was cheap and chemicals were high, we were overseeding every acre because we were counting on a lot of, of weed suppression from crop competition from a thick stand of soybeans. Then over time, you know, things flip-flopped. Seed got really expensive. Herbicides got cheap. Well, well, then you could lean on the herbicide for all the weed control, and you didn't really need the, the crop canopy for weed control. You know, now we're in an area where everything's really high, um, and you know, weed control is is more challenging in some cases. Um, so, so sometimes we we might need the help of that soybean canopy to to keep that field clean. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, you're talking about that sixty thousand plant density range for soybeans and weed control. You know, I think that varies greatly upon the year, the season and the growing conditions, how Absolutely. well the beans are growing. You know, yep. there's some, there's a well, lot of environmental variability and, there too. And it depends on how good your herbicide program is. Exactly. You know, when, when, when I say my field's down to 60,000 and stay clean, I've got a good pre, I've got overlapping residuals. I got two applications of dicamba, pre and, and post. So, so I've got a phenomenal weed control program to help keep that thin stand clean. If you're not using residuals and not doing this and not doing that, you know, you know, it's probably not going to be clean no matter how thick you plant, but it's certainly going to get weedier faster as that stand thins out. So absolutely right, Adam. It depends on how dense is your weed pressure. And I've got some foul fields. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that guy that's out there walking beans and, I uh, can't stand to see a weed in my field. If, if I've got an economic level of weed control, I'm, I'm generally okay with that. So I don't have the cleanest fields in the world, but, you know, even, you know, at lower seeding rates uh, with that good, strong herbicide program, I've been able to keep them, keep them clean. So we got about, uh, you know, 10, 15 more minutes here, unless we end early, just make sure you're getting any questions in. If you have any guys, text them in yeah. to your rep, whoever it may be. Um, our next Ask the Agronomist will be on the 10th of March, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. 10th of March. 10th of March. I had a dealer plant a bean plot on the 11th of March last year. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, it, it doesn't feel like planting weather I'm, today, I'm but uh, la know. last year we had that mid-March. I seeded waterways the middle of March. I did some spring strip till the middle of March last year. And, uh, you know, we, we just had our team meeting in, in Springfield a few days ago and there was water in every field between my house and Springfield. So yeah. it, uh, it, it, it's not looking like an early spring today, but we know that can change in a, in a hurry. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for participation. Uh, appreciate you all logging on. Appreciate the questions. Keep uh, got my email address up here. Lance dot. Forget. Don't forget the period at, uh, at bear.com, uh, send me your suggestions. I, I get, I actually been getting quite a few emails here lately with suggestions of topics that we can cover on Ask the Agronomist. Um, you know, I, I, I'd love it if you just chat in a question, but if you're not comfortable chatting in a question and you want to send me a suggested topic, uh, please, uh, um, please do that. Um, and if you have things you want to discuss, I, I have some great follow-up conversations with some customers after episodes of Ask the Agronomist, and sometimes that gives me some good fodder and good ideas for the for the next episode. So you uh, you, you don't want to rely on me to come up with the content. I, I need to rely on you to come up with the content to make sure it's good and relevant. So I uh, appreciate your support with that. 
Um, I see Merle typed in a question there. Six inches of snow predicted here tonight. All right. Yeah. yeah so, 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 Merrill, I'm uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, we've all had uh, uh, our share of snow this winter. It's it's been a. I don't know what the record wet February is, but uh, I've had over two inches of rain, not counting the snow precip in in February at uh, at our place, and uh, we're going through bedding like uh, like crazy, trying to keep cattle out of the out of the mud and the snow. So uh, it's been a uh, it's been a wet February, and uh, I, I hope that doesn't turn into a, a wet April and May. I, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I love a spring drought. Uh, I, uh, I don't worry about uh, drought until July. A, a drought in, in April and May is, is, is a good thing. So um, I, I hope we, uh, we don't continue this uh, excessively wet pattern into the, into the spring. I, I want all you guys to, to be able to raise uh, 300 bushels of, of $6 corn. And uh, and I'll be delivering my 450 corn right there, uh, right there with you, and uh, and hopefully uh, that's got, got got a chuckle out of Adam there. So, um, but anyway, thanks again, everybody, and uh, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and sign off, and give you uh, a little bit of your morning back, and uh, thanks again.